Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. The middle lesson the last few weeks has been from the book of Romans. We've been preaching mostly from the gospel. So uh, I'll take you back from a week or two ago where we read these words, which becomes uh, the basis for today's message. Chapter 8, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law could not do, weakened by the flesh. By sending his own Son in the likeness of human beings, and for sin he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in those of us who walk by the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. Let me ask you this question. If I was to ask you, how do you define what is a good Christian? A lot of people have in their minds a good Christian does the do's, right? Do all the do's in the Bible. Others would say, well, a good Christian is someone who doesn't do the don'ts, right? And I have found that if you do the do's, you don't have time to do the don'ts, but that's a separate uh, message altogether. What is a good Christian? We think of these answers, doing the do's and don't do the don'ts, because sometimes we, pre we present the Christian faith rather academically. And, um, and so, you know, you kind of go through the Ten Commandments and you kind of make a checklist. Well, has this ever been true of my life? Yes, I guess so. It's kind of like when I go to the doctor now, because I'm trying to get set up with doctors, right? You have to fill out your history, right? It's all alphabetical, you know. Do you have uh, asthma, you know? Do you have cancer, diabetes? You know, it's all alphabetical. And they tell you to be there five to 15 minutes early so you can fill out the same paperwork that you filled out at the last person you went to, right? And you, know, you could go through that checklist, and if you don't have too many check marks, you might well believe that you're okay, unless you check mark a certain thing like cancer or something that's a little bit more serious. But you kind of look through, and if the check marks are rather few, you think you're in good health. And if the check marks are many, then you probably would think you're in bad health. So you tell the doctor a little bit about when you go about the symptoms that you have. The symptoms on the outside, you know, my skin is itchy or I have a cough or something external. But he gets to the real cause, which is not external, not what you see, the rash you see or anything. It's something maybe more internal. The law of God is given to us to make us see not just the symptoms that we have are bad, but that it reveals something worse on the inside. And often we present the Ten Commandments so academically, it's just like a check thing, like your history. But it's meant to be experience. St. Paul experienced the law, uh, and he writes about it in chapter 7. Now, to experience the law would be to say, let's say JP or one of his friends up there, up in the balcony, um, was to take a leap off that balcony, you know? I don't know why they would do that, you know? Um, and you hope they don't. Well, don't worry, I don't think he can jump that far. But anyway, um, he's not doing the law of gravity. The law of gravity is doing him, right? Right? The law, we don't do the law. Sometimes the law does us. And that's what St. Paul experienced. He said the, the commandment was do not covet. The law came and said don't covet. And all of a sudden I, I, I started coveting. The law was doing him. You know, and led him to re re say these words. I believe there's nothing good in me that's in my flesh. Nothing good in me. 
Later on, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, the last verse of 1 15 is very interesting. The strength of, the, the strength of sin is the law. Sin gets its strength from the law. You all know that. Ladies, well, not to be sexist. Imagine your, your, your spouse, your partner, does not want to dance at a wedding. Can you, can you, can you work with me on this one? You know, can you imagine that being a possibility where your spouse does not want to dance? It's not that he doesn't like music. He maybe even likes dancing, but he knows he's clumsy. And to get out on the dance floor will reveal that he's clumsy. You hear me? The law reveals that we have sin in our nature. Now, this is a radical concept. I am not a sinner because I sin. I sin because I'm a sinner. I have a sinful nature. And it comes out differently. We're all infected with this sinful nature problem, this disease called sin. We're all lumped together. We all acknowledge that, but then we play a game that, yes, we're all sinners, but we like to see the differences, the distance between us, you know? We're all sinners, but don't you think those people in Washington, D.C. are more sinful than us? You know? Or in the inner city, aren't they worse than us? You know? Circumstances just brings out that sinful nature differently. We sin pretty much in a white collar type of way. But we are still sinners. One Christian that I know once said, he was reading um, the Psalms where the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and see if there's any way not right within me. You know? And so he read that and he said, Lord, show me my heart. Show me my heart. So about a week later, he got his family of four kids together with the dog. You know, this is an old story, so it was a station wagon. Today it would be a van, but think station wagon. It's much more effective if you think of the station wagon. All right? Dog, four kids, a wife, right? They set out for their journey. They're going from Florida to Texas, and it was about this temperature. Okay? And then the air conditioning went out. And the radiator overflowed. You know, he got snippy. And his wife got snippy back at him. The dog got sweaty. And then it got smelly. And then all the kids, you know, they couldn't breathe the same air as the person next to them. And they all started complaining. And sooner or later, dad lost it. And he too blew a gasket, so to speak, right? And then he remembered, he said to God, show me my heart. You see, if you have just the right conditions, your sinful nature comes out a certain way. And maybe it's not as gross or as wicked looking in your mind as somebody else's sin, but it reveals our heart is not right. And the law works externally and can't quite do anything for us. But the good news, St. Paul says, who can save me from this life? Who can save me from this predicament of the law bringing out sin in my life? Who can save me? Thanks be to God who sends Jesus Christ. Therefore, I can serve Jesus. Now we have two natures, my friends. Yes, we still have that sinful nature. But we now have a new nature in Christ Jesus. I think it was a Charlie Brown cartoon where Lucy was trying to explain Charlie Brown why he's sometimes good and sometimes bad. He says, Charlie Brown, you've got two dogs inside of you, a, a white dog and a black dog, you know, and they're constantly fighting. And which dog will win? Is the one that you feed. And if you feed yourself with just the law, it's going to stir up rebellion in you. The strength of sin is the law. 
And St. Paul says those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the sinful flesh. Right now you can think about anything you want, can you not? You can set your minds. That's where the battle really is. You set your minds on that which is not right, you will reap bad things. But if you set your minds on spiritual good things, you'll reap peace, is what St. Paul said. And what you need to learn as a Christian is to learn to set your minds. St. Paul says this, whatever is pure and lovely and worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on such things and the peace of God that passes all human understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Did you know that's a Bible verse? But it was used with this wonderful promise that if you set your minds on good spiritual things, you will reap peace. But we kind of took that Bible verse out of context, didn't we? And put it in our liturgy. Usually it's at the end of the sermon. I still remember being in a church in Milwaukee, Hope Lutheran Church, big church, you know, and the pastor quotes that Bible verse in the middle of his sermon at the best, maybe even the very front end. He, he speaks that verse, now may the peace of God that passes all human understanding. Two guys in the congregation stood up thinking it was time to sing the Create Me song. <laughs> Man, we are creatures of habit, aren't we not, you know? Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, said, God will keep him in perfect peace, him whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee, O Lord. We have a sinful nature, and we think that we can reform it, but it can't be reformed. It can be suppressed. Anybody love gardening, you know? You get rid of certain types of weeds in your garden, you know? You go away for a few days, and now you got a new type of weed in your, in your garden, you know? It's like you get rid of some, but others pop up. That's the way it is with our sinful nature. Yeah, we can kind of suppress certain things, but it still pops up in a different way. Maybe it doesn't pop up in the same way that your sins popped up when you were a teenager or a young adult, but they still pop up. It reveals that we can't do it. We can't live this life without Jesus in us. But the Bible says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. My friends, I believe the church should be a place where we believe that human beings are sinful, but God is good. God is good. But unfortunately, when you invite some people to go to church, they say, God, have you ever had this? I've had this happen twice in my life. Uh, it's inviting somebody to come to church and they say, I already feel bad enough about myself. Why would I want to come to church? <laughs> That's because, my friends, uh, we have created the church to be castles of purity. When we should really be basements of grace. Where sin doesn't shock us and grace still amazes us. That's what the Christian church should be like. And with this world as it is, my friends, and becoming more externally wicked, you know, we should, we should understand that we need to Pump up that grace more, you know, and share it more freely, because that is what sets people free. The good news in Christ Jesus. And again, we need to learn to set our minds on spiritual things. That's why church is important. That's why knowing scripture songs and knowing hymns are important. Those words planted in our hearts bring forth good stuff. There's a pastor who once told a story about a shut-in named Minnie. There were a lot of Lutherans at my first church named Minnie. You know, that was a very popular name for some reason. But uh, uh, this pastor went to Minnie for about eight years. She was a shut-in. She was pretty much wheelchair-bound uh, late in life. But she had a wonderful husband, lived in a nice house. But all every visit, uh, the pastor just heard the same litany of complaints in her life. And after eight years of being a pastor, hearing that same 
repertoire, that same recording, visit after visit after visit. The pastor one day was having a non-pastoral moment. <laughs> and he kind of lost it. He kept his cool, but he said, Minnie, I think this will be my last visit with you. Why, Pastor? Well, many I've been coming to serve you the Lord's Supper for eight years, quite faithfully, you know? And after eight years of sharing you the Lord's Supper and giving you a, a little devotion and prayer, um, you're just as negative and, and difficult as you were the first day I met you. No, I'm not. And many, yes, you haven't changed a bit. And so I've just not been very effective with you, you know? How can you say that, Pastor? He said, well, because many, every time I can't come, I'm amazed that you have a husband who takes wonderful care of you. You're in a beautiful house, beautiful yard. You've got so much to be thankful, but you're so ungrateful and so negative, you know. You need to learn just to set your minds. The first thing in the morning, just set your minds, you know, count your blessings before you consider your complaints. And so he gave her a few hints. And then he walked out. Really believing that was his last time that he would see this woman. Sunday morning came. There waiting for him in the narthex was the woman's husband. He says, Pastor, I want to talk to you. Yes, Don? You know that thing you said to my wife last week? He gulped and said, yeah, I, I seem to remember what I said. I just want to say one thing to you, Pastor. Go ahead, Don. What is it? You should have told her that years ago. <laughs> Why? Because she's trying, Pastor. She's trying. It's not her nature, but she's trying to set her minds a little bit more positively. And she is trying to remember every morning when she wakes up that she is a beloved, forgiven child of God. And it's making a difference. I believe that will happen to you, my friends. A lot of you already know that, don't you? That you're a beloved, forgiven child of God. And I'm not telling you anything new that you haven't heard from other pastors. He has just sent me to remind you today that you're loved and you're forgiven because of Jesus. I believe it will make a difference. In his name, amen. And now may there be a peace in your heart that passes all human understanding. And may this peace mount guard like a sentinel at the doorpost of your heart and keep it fixed on the Lord Jesus. Amen.